Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, my name is Mikey Mhenna. I'm the executive director of Afikra. Thanks so much for joining today's call. We are very honored to uh, welcome our very special guest, Arij Mi'ati. Arij is the managing director of leadership and culture of the Pillars Fund in Chicago. She works with uh, the Pillars Fund on creating and supporting opportunities that advance storytelling and culture change work. Prior to joining Pillars, she led the Persistence team as a managing director of Persistence at One Goal. With more than 10 years of nonprofit education and anti-racist organizing experience, her work can also be read and heard on outlets such as NPR, Al Jazeera, and Team Vogue. She earned her BA in theater and political science at the University of Minnesota and holds an MA in education from the University of North Carolina. She's also on the regional team, on the leadership team of Chicago Regional Organizers for Anti-Racism. Was that right? That was so right. You know, my favorite part is the the way you said my last name, like Sodubneni Mialti. I loved it. That yeah, never happened. sorry. No, I loved it. I was oh, like, yes, that never happens. I feel seen. <laughs> um, well, welcome to Africa Conversations. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me. It's my pleasure. Okay. So I have a question for you. When did you think you wanted to get into nonprofit stuff and education stuff? How did that happen? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I went to a Title I school in nice. Rochester, Minnesota. Um, uh, Title I schools, for those that maybe are international folks, are schools where uh, a high percentage of students are on free and reduced lunch. Um, so it's typically a lower income uh, population. And my school was primarily kids of color. And what was interesting about that is despite that, in all my honors and AP classes and, and advanced classes, I saw very, very few of those kids of color in my class. And it was primarily white kids. And I was really, really unsettled by that. And I think that actually just created this spark in me that um, I just really wanted to explore like why that was happening. Because these folks that I knew had you know, just as much potential, if not more, than the people sitting next to me in classes. And I think that really created this, um, this deep desire to investigate uh, why that was happening. And my work um, researching you know, race, class, and gender as a you know, political science student at University of Minnesota just really enticed me to continue in that area. And um, yeah, that, that's how it happened. I think I've always kind of known that I wanted to, to do something that felt contributive uh, to yeah. society. Okay, so when you talk about um, when you talk about uh, free and reduced lunch and sort of Title One school uh, and having sort of a large percentage of uh, kids, um, you know, of color, um, give us a little sort of background about that. Were you sort of built? Were you growing up in a an very Arab community, a very Muslim American community? Was um, was it a particularly diverse uh, sort of a diverse school broadly or was it more mostly african-american or mostly kids from latin america um, or south asia sort of walk me through that a little bit yeah it's a good question so um the area that my um that my family was in when i was in high school is rochester minnesota it's mm -hmm. if you see the geography of minnesota kind of looks like a boot it's in the toe of the boot in southeastern minnesota and um it was a really interesting place to grow up because uh, it was very, very few Arabs actually. Um, Rochester yes. is home to the Mayo Clinic, which is you know, one of the most prestigious hospitals in the United States and in the world. And um, because of that, the population is very, very transient. And so everybody that you know, basically came through that was Arab came through for just a couple of years to do a residency or a fellowship at Mayo Clinic and then would leave. So there weren't a lot of, of Arab folks. My family was one of the few Arab families. But what was really interesting is that Rochester is also one of the uh, premier places and one of the highest populations of Somalian and Hmong refugees in the United States. Yeah, that's right. States. I remember. I remember that. Yeah. 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 So. Um, my school was really, really heavily Somalian and Hmong, and actually it was one of the most diverse schools in America at that point with uh, the most countries represented of any school in Minnesota at that time. So it was pretty, pretty remarkably diverse, which is cool. Yeah, so um, we were talking earlier before we started the call about sort of your first foray professionally was in sort of education and, yeah. uh, and the sort of broader education reform movement that, um, that isn't particularly focused on, you know, Muslim American communities or Arab American communities. Um, when did you decide? I know that when I was also in that world, I really wasn't engaged with the Arab world at all. Um, how did you decide to make a pivot 
if it felt like a pivot, maybe it didn't, but make a pivot back into working with Arab American and Muslim American communities? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. I think, you know, one important thing about my work is it's actually like it is, it does, it's very inclusive of Arab communities, but it's more focused on Muslim communities, actually. And yeah. so um, it's very broad in, in the, uh, you know, identity spectrum, given that particularly Muslims in America are the most diverse religious group in the United States and potentially the world, actually, uh, which is pretty cool. And so um, that's one thing I'd say. And then the other piece I'd say is that it felt like a professional pivot, but it didn't really feel like a pivot in how I was living my life. Um, I would say, you know, when I tell people about what happened when I switched uh, from working at a nonprofit to working at Pillars, essentially, I felt like my five to 11 that I would do in my free time became my nine to five, which is a huge privilege to the things that you choose to do to become your full time job is a huge privilege. And so I feel like I've been really involved in kind of that space and in the art space since, you know, I was a teacher, uh, like yeah. you noted. Um, and I also felt uh, that my work as a teacher, and you, you know, I know Mikey, you and I were talking about how we both began, you know, our careers as teachers. And so I know you know this too, that teaching is a very political act. Um, yeah. I taught in the South where um, I was the first Arab teacher, the first Muslim teacher that most of my kids had. And so even though I wasn't necessarily working with majority Arab or Muslim kids, what I was able to do was be a window into that world and into that identity and sometimes be the first, you know, opportunity that kids had to really engage and build a relationship with someone who uh, was from, you know, our region and, and from, you know, for me as a Muslim as well. Yeah, it's interesting because like, so just to give context to the people on the call, um, can you explain in a sentence or, or a paragraph what Pillars is? why the Pillars Fund exists, why you decided to work there? Yeah, I absolutely can. So Pillars Fund is an organization that seeks to amplify the leadership, narratives, and talents of Muslims in America. And it started about 10 years ago as a volunteer group um, of trustees in the Chicago area that were thinking, how do I give my zakat in a better way? Um, and mm -hmm. They basically formulated this, this group of trustees that was able to, to vet organizations to do what um, our parents had, parents' generation had been doing, but advancing that work. So our parents' generation had done this amazing job building religious institutions across America. And what Pillars was seeking to do was build, you know, political power, build spaces for wellness, build spaces for opportunity that would amplify the talents of our of us beyond just the religious spaces. And um, about four years ago, it became its own institution, and we continued that grant making work. And what happened a year ago is I was brought on to um, actually advance storytelling work, which was a pivot for Pillars. But what is really interesting about that work is it's so deeply connected to our grant making work. Because what we realized is that all of these organizations we were supporting that you know were working on get out the vote and working on mental health in Muslim spaces, et cetera, all of those organizations were running into the same challenges again and again. And when we asked ourselves why, it was because they were swimming in this narrative ocean, right, of dominant yeah. tropes that were super harmful and continually just viewed through a stereotypical security lens, essentially. And um, what our storytelling work seeks to do is actually change the current of that narrative ocean to support the work that uh, Muslims are doing everywhere. And I think um, the reason I wanted to join Pillars is one, I felt it combined all of my passions. I mean, it could not be more of a dream job for me. Like I feel so blessed, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, my faith is really important to me. My identity and community is really important to me. Um, I love art, you know, like you said, I was a, I was a theater major in undergrad um, and I love education. And I felt like this actually just felt like it was made for me in a lot of ways. So I feel really lucky to be doing it. So um, thanks, that, that's fantastic. Um, so we had uh, Iman Abdel Hadi on, on the program a few, few weeks ago, who is this um, sociologist based at University of Chicago who looks at Muslim American communities and, and sort of um, also explores the idea of the, religious, the religiosity of those communities and how to sort of measure that and think about um, uh, uh, participation in those communities, uh, how, uh, how it sort of 
increases or uh, decreases based on how much religiosity increases or decreases. Have you guys thought about that as an organization? Like how can we increase the sort of participation in the Mus in these Muslim communities and increase the Muslim narratives, the Muslim American narratives um, in a way that allows people to have varying, um, varying levels of religiosity and sort of participate culturally in these places and spaces without any sort of belief? Does yeah. that make sense? It does. And it's a great question. It's something we've thought pretty extensively about. Um, you know, like we mentioned earlier, the Muslim community in America is is very ethnically and racially diverse, but it's yeah. also very, very diverse across the thought spectrum, the spectrum of belief, the spectrum of practice, et cetera. And um, our blanket rule at Pillars is if you say you're Muslim, then you're Muslim. We yeah. don't actually seek to, you know, put any type of judgment on, you know, sect or practice, et cetera. Um, we really want to be an inclusive space where our community can come together and, you know, lift up one another's experiences and stories. I mean, even the way we practice culturally, like it, someone who's religious and Lubnan might, might practice differently than someone who's religious in Bangladesh. And so I think, you know, we have to really honor the way that one another relate to our spirituality. Um, and I think that we, and I think that that shows and who, who we've been lifting up. Um, I think that there are folks who point blank say like, I identify as culturally Muslim and folks who, you know, say like, this is the most important part of my identity. And, you know, I, you know, practice in X, Y, Z way every single day. And so, um, that is something we've thought extensively about. And we try to show a range of, of the type of talent that exists within that spectrum. Okay, so this is a, this is a sort of a, a left field question, but it's it's one that I think you are well suited to try to like think through. Okay. So <laughs> it's one of those things that I think about uh, about a lot. So Africa is this global organization. We have global uh, folks from all over the world who have very different narratives and very and come to the space with Arab, the word Arab in their identity at varying different places. Sometimes it's the first word in that paragraph. Sometimes it doesn't exist at all. Sometimes it's like all the way at the end of the paragraph. Um, and America largely, the U.S. largely dominates the media landscape globally. Yes. And so the Arab American experience can often dictate um, the sort of the Arab outside of the diaspora, outside of the region experience. Um, and so I found it sort of ironic that typically Arab Americans who are trying to fight for their voice locally can sometimes drown out the, these other experiences outside of the U.S. because their their voice they're trying to speak louder than the local landscape, but even if they're like nowhere near at that volume, they're much louder than anyone else anywhere else, right? Yeah. So how are you and and like Rami as a show is a great example, right? Which which you have been involved in. So like Rami as a show is a really really good example because. In the states, it's it's making a dent, but everywhere it's making a tidal. Everywhere else, it's making a tidal wave, and it's similarly kind of drowning out a lot of other voices. So, mm -hmm. how do you balance that? How do you balance sort of like local um, local responsibility and like global responsibility that you're not even trying to engage? You're not necessarily. It's not even in the mission. Yeah, it's that's a great question. Um, I do think that. You know, like you said, what happens locally has a ripple wave and butterfly effect of what yeah. happens globally. And um, I think I think what's important is to create like spaces of, of, that are like brain trust spaces. I think, you know, um, yeah. if we use the example of Rami, like Rami's experience and, and the show Rami is entirely about a very, very specific Egyptian and uh, Arab family in New Jersey, like yeah. that's the story. And I think even, even like someone like me, like there's a lot that I don't relate to in the story and there's a lot that I do, but I think yeah. what, what makes it so compelling to view is that um, the more specific you get, uh, you're creating this like intimate knowledge, like a mirror and a window um, yeah. into uh, what folks experiences are. And um, I think when it comes to the, broader landscape, you bring up a really good question because I think Hollywood, you know, in particular is an extremely, extremely dominating force. Um, but I also believe that uh, 
you know, just like, you know, inshallah, Rami won't only, won't be the only, you know, Muslim story on TV. Um, I think that uh, in, in America, I hope that that means that it's opening up doors for, yeah. for people globally as well, because what some, what sometimes people don't know is that Hollywood and creatives are like obsessed with comps and what comps are is like, people are very, very afraid to risk their money on an idea that's not proven to make money. And so I think that what Rami's yeah. done, you know, he's got a few Over Emmy nominations under his belt. He's got the Golden Globe, et cetera. What it's done is like, he's proven that this can be profitable. And unfortunately, yeah, I think line. capitalism is the root of all evil, <laughs> but but for, but unfortunately that's what it takes to sort of open the door for other folks. And so I think the balance is um, knowing, and I know what Rami thinks about this a lot, is knowing that um, being, first doesn't mean that you know you want to be the only being first is a responsibility being first is the opportunity to open the door and bring five yeah. more people with you and so that that's kind of how i think about it is that we have a responsibility to to you know when we climb the ladder to to bring other folks and amplify their voices through our experiences through our platforms alongside us sorry that yeah. was a long answer <laughs> no, no, I mean, that's great. For me, there's no like single answer. I mean, yeah. if you can give uh, some context about maybe some some of those other voices that you're hoping to amplify, like what what are you working on right now that you're that's sort of like tickling you and getting you excited? Yeah. Uh, so one of the really exciting things that we're doing now is uh, there's an organization in the United States called The Blacklist. And uh, the Blacklist is an organization that uh, seeks to find the best unproduced scripts and put them on a list in order to be shopped and produced. Mm -hmm. And for the first time, I'm so excited about this, but Pillars for the first time partnered with the Blacklist this year to launch the first ever Muslim list. And what the Muslim mm -hmm. list is, is it's an opportunity for um, anybody who identifies as Muslim to submit a script of any genre. And I think that's really important because we debate it. Like, should it be any script about Muslims or should it be anything by a Muslim? And I'm really, really strongly of the belief that like Muslims get to tell more stories than just I'm a Muslim and here's my experience about being Muslim. I can't wait to see like the next female Muslim led sci-fi, you know, like what is that even going to look like? And I think there's a lot of opportunity there um, to seek to discover new voices. And what's cool about the Muslim list is that uh, people of any level can apply. So like you can have already had a produced screenplay that's like been in theaters, or you could be a first time screenwriter who's like, I have this great idea and I'm really proud of the script and I want your readers to read it. And so people can apply until December 4th. And uh, I hope you all tell your friends too, but people can apply until December 4th. And then we're going to kind of whittle it down to a short list uh, in the beginning of the year. And I'm really, really excited. So I, this is sort of stepping on other stuff that you're working on, but I'm, I'm curious. So how long have you been at Pillars? I've been there for about a year and a month. Okay. So what would you tell yourself a year ago <laughs> that you're like, Hey, you don't know this at all you you are you think something there is something that you deeply misunderstand about the job that you're walking into yeah it's a good question i think you know given the year that we've all had there's a lot of questions i have just about you know the way sure. control is a is a myth and an illusion and and covid is you know going to yeah. make all our plans totally irrational and, and unfeasible but um i think that something that i have really worked on is like, I'm gonna be real with y'all. Like I'm a complete control freak. Like I'm such a type A, like this is plan A, plan B, plan C. And then, you know, this is the outcome that we're gonna get. And I think what this job really taught me is that um, I knew this, but I didn't really know it until we started is that you have to take a lot of risks and strike a lot of irons for something to break through. Like something can be really good and still not make the impact that it deserves to make. There are so many factors at play for what is going to become, you know, the next thing that everyone's paying attention to. And so um, I think just the amount of work and the breadth of work 
that uh, we need to be paying attention to and uplifting is a real like necessity because it's not just about quality. Um, it, the world's an unfair place. There's a lot of quality stuff that does not get made, um, that does not break through. So I think that's a really big learning for me. And the other thing I would tell myself is that the outcomes for something like narrative change or culture change through media is generational work. It's really difficult to measure in terms of a year, two years. Um, so I think, you know, that's something I'm reminding myself that it's worth doing, um, that there's going to be something that I might do today that I might not see the, you know, fruits of until my, my lifetime is, has passed. And, um, I think that's, those are, those are a few lessons that I've learned is that it's generational and like, we need to be supportive of so many different, um, projects to, to create that ocean, that narrative ocean. Yeah. So are you trying to, yeah, are you, do you think is the approach, um, a quantity thing where it's like, you know, we're trying to produce as many projects as possible, um, regardless of how niche they are, but we're trying to not necessarily produce directly, but trying to get help produce lots of different projects, even if they have, um, a small, um, you know, fervent, uh, fan base but they're just really, really small projects and build this whole choir as opposed to small, you know, very loud voices. Is that the, is, is that the strategy or the strategy is like, we want the next two and a half men and we're going to, we're going to try to produce the next two and a half men featuring Kamal Nunjani or whatever. <laughs> I think, I think it's a both and uh, one, you know, for example, like we can't deny like the power that, you know, a show like Nami has had on what's possible for us here. And I think, you know, I don't know if I'd call them small projects, but like you said, small fan bases. I do think that one mistake that we make is that even though only 1% of Americans are Muslim, um, we treat it as a census sometimes. And what I mean by that is we think, you know, if 1% of the shows or 1% of the representation on TV is Muslim, then we're doing our job. But I actually totally disagree with that. And the reason for that is that, um, First of all, yeah. ironically, Muslims are actually not underrepresented. They're overrepresented in all the wrong ways. There's way, way more Muslims on TV doing bad things than there are Muslims in, in the United States. And so I think um, if we treat it like a census, we're going to miss out on the opportunity to create a narrative ocean and as many stories that, like you said, that choir, that reverse the current because right now the narrative ocean is going is flowing towards that security lens the good muslim bad muslim tropes we all know them but if we're able to create multiple stories that change the mental model that people have of what a muslim is what a muslim's interested in who they are what their families look like etc then we can reverse that narrative ocean so it's going to require more than one percent yeah who else in the space is doing really good work that you admire yeah, there's a lot of great people doing amazing work. Um, one of the organizations I would recommend people look into is the Pop Culture Collaborative. They're an awesome funder of ours and they've done a lot of really, really great research on what it takes to create culture change. Um, I think, you know, uh, Illuminatives, who does culture change work around uh, indigenous populations in the United States is doing awesome work. Color of Change, which is uh, the uh, the country's largest uh, online racial justice organization, is doing a ton of amazing work. Um, they just actually ran a campaign, for example, and got cops canceled um, from from the A and E network. And so um, they've done a lot of great work around research that shows how propaganda or propaganda that's that's pro police is overrepresented on TV and, and trying to reverse that because it's totally skewed the way that we view the justice system in America. So there's a lot of really great allies and friends of ours that are doing amazing work out there. So if you were to help me sort of understand the vision of uh, the Pillars Fund. Yeah. In, in 25 years, is this work still being done or are you kind of trying to work yourself out of a job? I think the goal with every nonprofit is to work yourself out of a job. And if you're not trying to do that, then 
it probably shouldn't be a nonprofit. <laughs> I think I, I, that's something like I fundamentally believe. Um, I don't know if it's, if it's only going to take 25 years. Sure. And the reason I say that is because when we look at partners at organizations like Color of Change, like GLAAD, you know, the LGBTQ community and the, the black community in the United States have been doing this work like for decades and are still doing the work. Um, so I do think that we'll see a, a big shift in 25 years. Um, I don't know that I think our work will be done in 25 years. Um, but I, but what I hope to see by then is that um, my issue is no stories about us without us. I think that needs to be done. And if we can get to that in 25 years and say, you cannot make a story that is about me without me, um, I think that will make a huge difference. And that does feel like like a possibility in the, in the next 25. Is the idea... Um is the sort of the, if I were speaking to the head of the board of trustees, um, uh, do you think they would say, okay, that's totally true. Now I'd like to also turn to the broader global uh, Muslim world uh, as well. Yeah, it, it's a good question. Um, I, I think, you know, Pillars, Pillars is actually quite a small organization at this point. Um, and sorry, Mikey, you might have still been talking. You were freezing a little bit. Oh, somewhere. I froze. Sorry, Lebanon internet, my fault. I know. I I figured, uh, <laughs> but um, I I don't actually think so. Okay. Um, I you know Pillars is pretty uniquely focused on Muslims in America at this point, point. Yeah. Um, and I think that, like you said uh, early on, we don't want to drown out the experience of folks that are you know living in you know the global majority community that are identified yeah. Muslim. We, I, I think ultimately they probably know better than we do what they need in their own spaces. Um, we'd love to partner with them, ally with them, amplify them. Yeah. But I think ultimately like the, the work should be centered from those communities. Totally. So I think, um, I think you know, we've, we've got plenty on our hands here, here in the United States. I love it. Um, okay. I'm going to move on to the sort of quick Q&A and then we're going to open yeah. up to the chat. And then if we have time at the end, uh, I may ask you a few more stuff. Great. Um, okay. So what are you reading or watching right now? Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little overwhelmed with the amount of input that we've all been yeah. taking. Like I have input overload. So I think in times like this, I'm much more interested in creating to like empty my vessel because it feels so full. Sure. But um, that being said, I'm reading a great book by my friend and colleague, Hussein Rashid called Miss Marvel's America. And it's this great collection that brings together scholars from a range of disciplines that are exploring the significance of Marvel's first Muslim superhero for a broad readership. So that's, that's a really great read if you're interested in culture change work and the way representation can make a difference. Um, as for what I'm watching, I'm watching Lovecraft Country on HBO. I'm a few episodes behind, so no spoilers, but um, I just love the like heavy race conscious sci-fi. I'm a total sci-fi geek. I think that sci-fi asks the questions that other genres are like afraid to ask. And, um, and for like the light days, I'm watching this show called Hot Dog, like H-A-U-T-E which is a dog grooming competition show. Mm. Highly recommend. It's delightful. Also asking the Love tough dogs. questions other genres are not willing to ask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, what would a dog look like? A, what would a dog look like as a teddy bear? If you want to know, that's the show. No spoilers. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Hmm. Uh, so many people. I'm really lucky that I've gotten to spend time with a lot of people I do admire, but I think if I had to choose one person that I don't have the opportunity to right now, I would love to shadow James Baldwin for a day. Um, his writings have been a really incredible inspiration to me as an educator, both as a teacher and as an anti-racism trainer and creator. And I think they really helped me hold myself accountable to my own growth. And he also seems like he'd be like a really great hang over a cup of coffee. Like there's like no better conversationalist. So. so here's a question for you. Yeah. At what age do you want to hang out with James Baldwin? Ooh, I wasn't ready for that. Because <laughs> um, there's a couple of different Baldwins. You're right. I'm going to have to think about this. Think about that but, one. Think about that one. Yeah, but I, but I do think like 
I do think that I would like to meet him in the same stage of life that I'm in. So yeah. I'm 31. So it would be cool to see what, what a genius like James Baldwin is at my age. So I can, you know, like up my game. Sure. Okay, great. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? Mm. I think, you know, one of my colleagues, I admire Rashad Robinson, who leads Color of Change. He often says this phrase I love, which he says, uh, do not mistake presence for power. Um, presence and representation is not enough. And I think, you know, a lot of people say that if you're not at the table, you're on the menu, but I actually disagree with that. I think if you're not in the kitchen cooking, you're on the menu. So my goal is really to create pipelines for the abundance of talent that already exists to get access to the kitchen, you know, not just be tagged in for a stamp of approval at the end. And I think, um, I think something else that people don't maybe mis maybe do misunderstand about my work is that there actually are a lot of people already doing this that are good enough. Like there is an abundance of talent in the Muslim community that's just not getting the opportunity. So it's really about like finding and building pipelines for them rather than like trying to like hone talent or convince people that this matters. Um, yeah, I would say that's, that's a big so, Okay, so here's another question. You've mentioned a couple of times before I get to the next one, you've mentioned a couple of times about the sort of the heterogeneity, heterogeneity of the Muslim American community. Yes. How much of your work is to really introduce the Muslim America, uh, American community to itself? A lot of it. Um, okay, we yeah. have this, we have this Muslim narrative change cohort right now, which actually some of the folks that you've interviewed here are a part yeah. of. So Omar Efendim and Maitha Al Hassan are both our fellows at Pillars. And uh, that group, what that group is really trying to do is um, create a strategy for narrative change that is for uh, the American Muslim community. And we've debated this a lot. We were like, should our strategy be external, like for people who don't belong to our community? Or do we actually need to start with an internal, like intra-community strategy? Yeah. And um, I, we think it needs to be two-pronged because you're absolutely right. Like there's so many silos and so many different communities. Like there's no one Muslim community. Um, and I think that uh, it's it's really, really important to show people and show, you know, Muslims in America, like, hey, the Arab in Detroit, like here's what, you know, the, the black Muslim in South Carolina is doing and vice versa. And that creates like just a really, really powerful space for collaboration. Yeah, it's, it's really, okay. So I'll save a few of my questions till the end <laughs> if there's time. Okay, so you kind of asked, uh, answered this already, but maybe there's somebody else. Whose work are you, do you admire or are inspired by? A ton of people, um, again, many of whom you've interviewed on this very show. Um, I would say someone who I'm thinking about a lot right now is my dear friend Shireen Demra. Um, if you're not familiar with Shireen, she is a Palestinian uh, illustrator that has been making beautiful images that are political um, under her Instagram, Shireen Creates. I can throw it in the chat later. I would highly recommend following her. She's um, really, really making just beautiful images of people who are often viewed um, as, you know, a danger to society, as, you know, victims as, of tragedy, et cetera, in a beautiful way. So one of her most famous images is um, after the tragic murder of George Floyd in Minnesota, um, she created this really beautiful um, image that sort of showed him in a very peaceful light covered in flowers and with his eyes closed. And I think it just became like a, a beautiful, um, a beautiful representation of the moment and kind of like fired up the movement in a way that um, was really inspiring to me. And I love just the work that she creates and the way that she um, kind of forces us to decolonize ourselves in the ways that we typically view uh, folks that have been victims. Um, it's, it's super inspiring to me. Cool. Yeah. Um, okay, great. Let's open up to the questions. We have a couple of questions so far. I think okay. Fatima, you're gonna be the first. Um, and then we have Batul and then Harufa, I think your name is. Uh, Fatima, you wanna unmute yourself and you go ahead. All right, so um, my first question is about your response to Mikey pronouncing your name. You said like, I feel seen. And I really love that. And I just wanted to know kind of in your opinion and your from and from your personal experience, uh, what makes people feel seen and acknowledged? Mm. Um, I have a friend who I think embodies this perfectly. She's my best friend. Her name's Saprita. 
She's a Lao American woman. And um, she does this thing that I love that uh, she'll send me a meme that's like about Arab culture or Muslim culture or something. And she'll say like, I saw this, I didn't understand it. I went down a rabbit hole for an hour on the internet and now I think it's so funny. Isn't it so funny? And it, I, it makes me feel so loved. I think like what makes people feel seen is for you to truly deeply try to investigate and understand who they are, what their culture is and like dialogue with them about it. I think like sharing humor and different cultures is like one of the highest forms of love. It's so, so complex. And um, I always like to share that example because I think what it requires of us is to, um, is to not just slide away when we see something we don't understand. Like when we see something that is important to someone we love to pause and say, I wonder why this is important to them and then find out. Mm -hmm. I really think like when that happens, um, you just create like a level of intimacy and depth with others, um, both on the micro scale and the macro scale that is impossible otherwise. Bronson, kind of the, the topic of identity, what was your earliest memory of your identity being so important to you or kind of what was the turning point that made it so? Yeah. Um, so my family immigrated from Lebanon when I was about five years old. So it happened pretty early on. Um, I remember my first day of school, I only spoke two words of English, good night and toilet, both fairly unhelpful. And um, I remember um, there was one kid in my class, Hadith, who I'm still friends with, who uh, kind of took me around and uh, just translated for me all day in my kindergarten class. And um, that's when I kind of realized, like I was in, in Lebanon, I was in, honestly living in a pretty like homogenous bubble. I lived in Tripoli where like everyone was a Sunni Muslim like me, et cetera. And um, I think uh, for the, I think the first time being outside of that homogeneity and um, seeing other people see me in a way that uh, was different made me realize that um, I had culture, right? Because I think when you're part of a dominant culture, that's just what's considered normal and right and good. And um, when you're out of it, you're like, oh, like I, there is something here and it's worth investigating and it's different than all these other identities around me. So I think, I think it happened pretty early on. Thank you. Cool. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, Batul, I think you are next. Yes. Hi, Adiyaj yeah. and hi, Mikey. Hi, everybody. My question is, um, so from your personal experience as well as in your work, um, did you come across any stories about uh, Muslim Americans and how their life kind of changed after 9-11? And then do you, did you get a chance to follow up with them on how that changed maybe like 19 years after that today, like in 2020? Yeah, um, I think that there, it's interesting because there are many stories about that and, and most of them are not written by Muslims, which I think is a really important thing to call out. Um, and most of them are not written by Arabs either, which who also really suffered and, and South Asians and Sikhs and all these people that were perceived as part of the enemy. Um, but yes, I have come across um, a lot of those uh, stories that are post 9-11 stories. Um, and I think, you know, there aren't necessarily a lot of stories that I've personally come across that are specifically about 19 years later, how is my life different because of 9-11? But um, there are definitely stories that talk about the impacts 19 years later without, without um, explicitly saying this is because of 9-11. So um, there is a recent film. Um, I am blanking on the name of it, but I will definitely send it to Mikey uh, after this, there's a recent film that is about, um, it was set in Chicago. It was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest, but South by Southwest got canceled this year. And it was um, about a police officer who was Muslim, who essentially was roped into spying on his own community um, in Chicago at the, their local mosque. And it becomes this, this really interesting tale where like his own father gets implicated, et cetera, and they're all innocent, but 
he has to sort of reckon with his own place in, you know, the, the system and like the way that he's sort of like betrayed his community. And so that was a really interesting one, but again, not, not necessarily explicitly saying because of 9-11, this, this, that, but I do think there's a lot about that security lens that people, people tend to view the Muslim world through. Okay, cool. I think we have one last question from Rumi. Hi, hi, hi. This is Rumi from, uh, from Bangladesh. Actually, uh, interesting is what you were talking about. The, the narratives have been always sort of, you know, we trying, I mean, we as a community trying to blend or how we sort of see ourselves in the U.S., right? But what I was just referring to, there's some amazing authors like Alex Shafak, who've just come out, you know, she wrote this book a couple of years ago, called 40 Rules of Love, right? And then there are some of the great books that are written on Syria, and there's a book I read called Among Muslims in Pakistan, but they're written by Western authors. And what I think could be very interesting is to take the story up on its head and move it and convert that into a film where these the sort of narratives are not just the community trying to, of course, there is a role that, you know, people need to see that how we're adjusting to the American society or the European society or a greater part of the West. But what's also interesting is to get that exposure of how this interracial blends can happen um, bes besides the U.S. being on the main focus, right? So I, you know, I mean, what I'm trying to say, in other words, that there are some amazing, beautiful themes. If, there are, if they could be interwoven into films, which kind of bring in, you know, like in 40 Rules of Love, it's Rumi, the Sufi Rumi, and then it goes into the contemporary stories, right? So I think that could be something opening up a whole different world out there, which is some, something which is a lot of the viewers, I've, at least from my experience of seeing, because I've lived in the West for many years, I mean, they're not aware of, or there's, there's not a bit, enough exposure about it. So I don't know. I just wanted to just leave the thought with a cage and I, you know, because this is a different way of looking at it. And I think there's some brilliant stuff out there, at least the, 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 the novelists who have actually written amazing books, uh, the fiction reads mostly, but it's, it's, it's very, I mean, it, it can blend well with the global audience. You know, Isabel Allende does that with Latin America and rest of Europe and Middle East. So I'm just, I'm wanting to know your views on that. I mean, just, this is what I thought that this could be something interesting. Yeah, um, it, it's certainly interesting. And I think, you know, one really important thing that you named uh, is, you know, that there are so many novels out there. And right now in, in the media space, at least in the United States, um, intellectual property is king. And so a lot of folks um, we recommend for them to draw from some, some type, of, type of intellectual property, which absolutely includes things like novels. And I think we're going to be seeing a lot more of that in the next couple of years. So I, I totally agree. Um, and I agree that there's a lot that can be done um, via a global audience. And I think that work is incredibly important. Um, it's just not the focus of Pillars right now. And I think the reason for that is one, like we're a fairly young organization. And two, um, there is this idea that Muslims are newer to the United States. And the truth is that there actually has never been an America without Muslims. That's actually, that's something that one of my colleagues, Hussein, who's part of our Muslim narrative change cohort often says. Um, and I think that what we're currently working on is making sure that America understands that, that we're not, um, this new, this new, um, presence that we've been here since, you know, they stole people, enslaved people from Africa and brought them here against their will. And um, I think right now the focus is, is really uh, to tell that story that we've been here since the beginning. And um, that doesn't mean a story of assimilation at all. I don't think it's about talking about like how we quote unquote, you know, adapted to the West or, or anything. We're actually not really interested in stories of assimilation. That's not really our, our thing at all. Um, but what I do think is, is important um, is to show that you can be Muslim, you can be religious, you can be Arab, you can be South Asian, you can be Black, and hold all of those pieces of culture to heart and still be American. And that doesn't mean that you're assimilating. It means that America needs to open up its mind and think and broaden its definition of what an American is, how an American acts, what an American looks like. 
And um, I, again, totally agree with you that that would open up something totally new and interesting. I'm not sure that Pillars is the place to do that just yet. Um, but I, I, cause I think our focus is more on that piece right now of like, it's not about asking, I always say, it's not about asking America to let us in. Like, I think we were, we used to be in this place of like, please let us in. We're normal. That's not what we're interested in. What we're interested in is America is saying to America, check us out. We have a lot to offer. Look how awesome and dope we are. Check us out. And like, if you don't, it's your loss. And so that's sort of, that's sort of how um, we approach things right now. I'm going to end on one final question. Um, is I guess basically I'm asking as as Rumi was asking the question, what is a success story that Pillars is sort of modeling itself on? Who has successfully done what Pillars is trying to do? Yeah, um, I think one really really good example is the African American community in the United States. Um, for example, we went from minstrelsy, this incredibly racist, awful, unacceptable form of entertainment to Black Panther. And in between were things like the Cosby Show and you know many other examples. But um, I think that you know while I'm not trying to say that there's no racism left on TV because God knows that there's way too much of it, um, partic particularly anti-Black racism, um, but I do think that uh, they've really succeeded in creating um, art that is for them, by them. And it is so specific and nuanced to them that everybody else is excited about it. I think people think that to create something that everybody gets pumped about, it has to be like super broad and universal. But I actually think the more specific you get, the more universal you get and the more interested people will be in the story. And so yeah, yeah. go ahead. No, I was going to say that I think it, I think the, and I, again, uh, I am HO, uh, but like, I think that the more that it's actually intra, intra community and it's saying like, I don't care if you think we're dope. I actually care 0% if you think we're dope. This is for us by us. Um, if you happen to want to come to the party, fine, the door's open, but this is for us by us. We're not pushing anybody else, but I think that largely I would imagine is the, is the roadmap. Yeah. I, I co-sign that a hundred percent. I think we're most interested in, we don't actually, if our community doesn't like it, then we don't want it out there. It, it yeah. has to start with us like loving it. And um, I, I think that was really beautifully said how you said it. And I think the black community has really given a masterclass in that over the last you know, 200 years um, of, of chipping. Yeah. Okay, well, this was really, really fun. Um, Thanks so much for joining. Thank you to everyone for joining. I put a couple link chat. I'll just make, I'll just go over them uh, again. Um, please give us feedback on how this event went. I posted the event, the link. The link is hafikita.com slash what is this good? This is a one question survey. So let us know if it was good. So we know what to do. Um, please support our work. We're trying to build this open community library. Me and my team in, in Beirut are trying to build this um, in a region without community libraries. We're trying to be one. So please support us. A small but very meaningful contribution goes a long way. Okay, everybody, have a nice night or day wherever you are, and we'll see you soon. Thank you.